Hi everyone, I'm Gordon Burkell from Filmmaker U. At Filmmaker U, we create courses for film professionals to deepen and diversify your existing skill set. Every week at Friday, we go live with a film professional to chat and give you a chance to join us and ask questions. Uh, today, I'm joined by Joe, Joe Goller, a colorist whose work includes Arrival, Midsommar, uh, Solo, The Star Wars Story, Run Lola Run, amongst so many other projects. Welcome to the show, Joe. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, I guess we were chatting a bit before, and you mentioned that you had done remastering on over 100 Criterion films. Yeah, um, well, or certainly close to 100. Um, and that, yeah, so for me to kind of talk about how my feature film colorist career got started, you know, I, um, I came to New York, uh, you know, around 2000 and was, you know, like a commercial colorist and um, and doing spots and Super Bowl spots and stuff like that and, and life was good and there was no real like feature film digital intermediate uh, process at that time it was all you know photochemical finishing so my sights weren't really set um, on feature films at that time you know I had gone to like film school and stuff like that but I was happy you know doing the work that I was doing and then um, you know, I got introduced to the people from the Criterion Collection and they, um, you know, were doing Laserdisc originally and then they were having to, you know, remaster the, a lot of these titles yet again for this, you know, high, di uh, want to say high dynamic range, uh, uh, high definition um, masters, you know, in the, the facility I was at at the time in New York called the Tape House, which no longer exists, sadly. Um, they had one of the first like high def telecines, a spirit, like early, early spirit data cine telecine. So, um, so yeah, I got to start, you know, remastering feature films. All of a sudden, instead of working off of a film negative, I'm working off of, you know, uh, interpositives and, and working uh, off of like, you know, amazing, amazing, like important movies, you know? So, uh, you know, we did Seven Samurai together. I did Juliet of the Spirits, Breathless, and, um, you know, all these just like Fellini films, Kurosawa films, like all these amazing films. And then all of a sudden, you know, some of the, the, the filmmakers that were still alive um, would come in. And so all of a sudden I'm sitting with <laughs> Richard Linklater or uh, Wes Anderson or Jim Jarmusch. And I'm like, now these people are really cool. You know, like it, it's a, it was a different energy than the commercial work. So, you know, it, it's, both are rewarding, but they work a little bit different part of your brain um, when you're working with a, a bunch of, you know, agency uh, creatives versus, you know, filmmakers on a movie that they've, um, that, 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 that they've made. So, you know, for me, that was like what moved me from, I, I still do a lot of advertising, but, you know, mostly known now for my feature film work. And so um, doing more and more of those titles, once this digital intermediate process became a reality on the East Coast, I was kind of one of the two or three people that had this kind of street cred as both a feature film guy that, you know, worked in this digital world. And, uh, and so that's how I then started doing long form, like actual digital intermediates for theatrical release. Um, and that's when then I moved to Technicolor um, when they built a new studio in the West Village and started doing films like Devil Wears Prada and working with Wes Anderson on Darjeeling Limited. And then it just kind of like built from there. And it was really uh, a beautiful thing. Now, I have two questions from that. Did you work on 400 Blows for Francois Truffaut? Ah, no, no, oh, okay. I did 400 Blows. And um, my other is like, what is it like to have to like to open up and start to touch, I guess, cinematic classics like The Seven Samurai? Is there a stress that you know you've got to make maintain this sort of iconic status, or is there sort of like, I don't know, I, I'm just interested in that sort of it's, fact. It's a good question, and it's always this um, conversation I'll have, you know, with Lee Klein is the technical director still to this day at Criterion, and they're really great at like scouring the planet for like the best film element, you know, to work with. So we know that, you know, to the best of our knowledge, we've got like the best kind of element available just to, to start 
uh, to start from. And we may watch uh, film prints that we know were approved. We may even see other um, video masters that had been approved years earlier. And so uh, I'll kind of take some of that. Uh, this is assuming the filmmakers aren't, are no longer alive and which may be a 50-50 thing on the Criterion titles. And, uh, and then you're right, it's like, sometimes you see like uh, something that you think you could make better by putting a little window or a shape or a key or something. And you're like, well, you know, without, without Fellini here with me, maybe, you know, we got to stay pure, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to, uh, to what we see, but, you know, they also do such a great job of all the restoration after we do the color. So, you know, when, once I finished grading a film with them and, and, more or less like happy with it. Then when I get that Blu-ray months later, I'm just blown away at like everything else that happens after the grade. It's all the, 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 the dust busting and like fixing all the splices and, and any like film damage, all of that kind of stuff that um, there's just takes, takes such great care with. And then even just like their compression that they do for the DVD just to make sure that it's just as exquisite as possible. Uh, you end up with this like gorgeous kind of remaster like you know hopefully you brought something to it with with the color and you stay true to what the filmmaker's intent was um but to your point too sometimes we're working with filmmakers that you know are still alive uh or the cinematographer or somebody comes in and the, yeah they they will have moments where like you know what that always bothered me that you know we couldn't fix that back in the day and now that i'm in here with you and we have these wonderful extra tools to like shape and and manipulate things, we will do that as long as the filmmaker is the one there that's asking for it. Wow. How do you, because in something like that, when the, the filmmakers are alive, so they've made the film, they've done all the work on it, and now they're sort of remastering it, but do you still come in and, and work with them on looks and stuff like that, or is it just coming in and tidying it up a bit for the, the remaster? Right. Uh, well, it's a little bit of both. Um, you know, it's, that's the cool thing about, you know, shooting on film is uh, there was so much information in the film and it's like the scanning technology keeps improving and the display technology keeps improving. So, you know, every time you bring that, that film back up and scan it every 10 years or whatever, you can make it better. Not because the film is any better. It's just because the technology to like, capture what is in the film keeps keeps improving. You know, now we're in 4K, you can do high dynamic range and and all of this kind of stuff for, for these films. Now, I haven't remastered any older films in high dynamic range. I don't know where where people sit on that <laughs> uh, ethically, but, um, but yeah, so it, it's just great to like, you know, you could see how people have been uh, experiencing the film on some kind of a video element, um, and then see how much crisper and better resolution and better color fidelity you can do without even having to like necessarily make it different. You know what I mean? Um, and then when also when we'll go through the film elements and we'll look at kind of other approved masters, you start to gleam like, well, all right, this, this, this was approved, but like we certainly like we can do better because like there's all sorts of weird crosstalk in the highlights where it's all magenta and like we like we we can do better than that like and so you have these kind of technical things that you um, you do to kind of just pull as much uh, out of the film element as you can. Now, so um, I guess what I was gonna one of the questions I was gonna ask is like one of the first times I was sort of impacted by color in film is I think about Run Lola Run and the way they use like the red in her hair and different things like that. Was there a moment where you saw a film or a commercial or a TV show and you're like, that's what I want to do. I want to do the color. <laughs> <laughs> or was it, was it something else? Was it like you saw a piece of artwork or something like that? Yeah. Well, you know, my, my father was a photographer and so I spent a lot of time with him like in dark rooms and things like that. Um, with his, I mean, just like, it's more of a semi-professional uh, photographer, but, um, you know, being a colorist, you know, when I was going through school and then just starting off uh, in post-production, it, it's such a, 
obscure, like you don't really learn about it in school. I think now, you know, people have access to these tools, you know, um, in their, in their homes, on their laptops. And it's just like such a different time. But when I was coming up, the thought of being a colorist, you know, wasn't really on my radar until I had an opportunity to get into a post facility and, and start kind of making my way up the ranks. And I was like, wow, like, what's that cool machine that they put the negative on and, and, you know, like started like getting mentored by a colorist. Uh, I got started in, in Miami actually back in the nineties. And um, actually the, to, to that point too, like coming up in a smaller market where there were no rules. Like, I think if you're coming up in a New York or LA, there's a real like apprenticeship uh, and like structure maybe to the way you come up. When, when I was coming up doing music videos and commercials in Miami, like there was nobody in my way. Like as long as I wanted to put in the hours and uh, you know, I could ask the clients if I could use their film like after they finished with it and start testing and everything like no one was in my way and I moved up very very fast and then like it was very it's a very creative environment there and then I was able to then in 99 or 2000 I was hired to go work uh, in New York and uh, and that that was like a whole new kind of you had to learn a whole new discipline um, once I was in New York you couldn't just spin the dials and come up with crazy looks anymore you know. Now, uh, well, first, did you ever spin the dials and someone go, what are you doing? <laughs> or <laughs> was it just like, oh, I better not do this here in New York? Yeah. Well, you know, because in uh, different markets, uh, it, it operates differently. And, and uh, at the time in Miami, I would sit with the director and the cinematographer. And then my first session in New York, I was with the editor and uh, agency, like art director, and that was a whole new experience for me. I literally was waiting for the session to start. Like I, I wasn't working because I was waiting for the cinematographer and the director to show up. And they like, it doesn't work that way in New York. Um, and so they're like, what are you waiting for? I'm like, where's the DP? How do we, how can we color correct the film without the DP? And they're like, no, we don't do it that way. <laughs> um, and so that was like another learning experience. Um, and uh, anyway, yeah, so always learning experiences, but I think it was great, like coming up in a smaller market and really getting to do just like a variety of things and then uh, taking that skill and being able to, I, I'd probably still be an assistant, <laughs> you know, if I started <laughs> in New York uh, working underneath somebody. Now you mentioned also that you, there was sort of a mentor in Miami. Yeah. What, a, a who was the mentor, if you're able, allowed to tell us, I guess, or comfortable telling us, but also what were some of the things that they taught you that you still use to this day or tricks or little things that, you know, might've been specific to film, but you find very useful on, on digital? Sure. I had an incredible mentor. Um, he is no longer with us, unfortunately, but his name was Scott Gardner and he was just super talented and really, um, a really fun kind of crazy guy and like taught me like, to like, hey, you need to know what you're doing, but then you got to make sure you're having a good time doing it at the same time or else like, what what's the point? Um, and so I've always tried to like, you know, I always keep Scott in the back of my mind, like what, what would he do? Because he definitely pushed the creative limits. And um, and then the, the, uh, the other thing is just work ethic, you know, like post-production, um, certainly with colorists, uh, like I, I just work, around the clock, seven days a week, like whatever the filmmakers need, I got to be there for them a hundred percent. And and I learned that from Scott as well. The guy just worked like crazy. And so, and I was fine with that. And, um, and so I, I do, I put in a lot of, a lot of hours and I learned early on that if, if, if you want to make it as a colorist, like, you know, your filmmakers don't ever want to hear that you're not available. So you always make yourself available to them. How do you find a work-life balance in that situation? You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I see that you have a wedding ring on, so I'm assuming yeah, your, your spouse is probably uh, like, oh, "Wait a second. <laughs> no, I'm 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 very proud to have been able to at least maintain my relationship with my wife and have a wonderful family life. It's it's all great. It's it's not as bad as as it used to be. Um, also, on top of all of this, like 
I started my own company and Harbor Picture Company about 10 plus years ago now. So mm -hmm. that on top of everything else just created this whole like experience of like having to be committed because like everything was on the line. You know, I took my life savings built a post facility with uh, my partner and uh, crossed my fingers that it was going to work. Um, and thankfully, <laughs> thankfully it did. Now you also, you worked on Arrival and I, I had the, the, I was really lucky to interview Joe Walker about it. And oh, he's very, very much a, like almost philosophical about storytelling. So how did you work with uh, Villeneuve to, like, how did you use color as a storytelling tool in that film? So, I mean, I'm really proud of of everything with that 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 movie. Um, it's one of those dream scenarios where Denny is such like a thoughtful, philosophical, like collaborative guy. Joe Walker is an incredibly sweet, talented, uh, collaborative guy, and then Radford Young, the cinematographer. He's one of my dearest friends, and um, and so he's he's kind of brought me along with him as as his career has just kind of exploded over the uh, over the years. So um, it was such a like Zen creative experience experience working with those guys. When it's not always that's not always the case, you know. So that was just like to have made this you know, kind of sci-fi movie, but that had all this kind of poetry and, and emotion in it um, is so unique to be able to make a film like that. And, and, and honestly, when when Bradford and I kind of finished our our work on the grade and uh, and we watched it with Denny and then we had the, heard the sound and everything, you know, we just hoped that it would connect like with an audience because that's a hard kind of movie to get made. And thank God that people really like connected and, 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 and got it with, with that film. Um, but uh, emotionally, like with, with, with the color, um, you know, Bradford has a very like special uh, talent. You know, he, he has this really kind of dark and, 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 and soft and just beautifully like poetic. I, 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 I can't use that word enough when with Bradford's work, you know, uh, he's just got like a special sense uh, and, and, and like a, a, an energy about him that somehow makes it up on the screen. I don't know how he does it. And we've been kind of mind melding since his early Sundance movies. Uh, that's another kind of just relationship in my career. I'm just so grateful for and like every kind of creative, you know, whether you're a cinematographer or you who finds their director and you do these great things and have this career together you know, Bradford and I did a film called Pariah that won Best Cinematography at Sundance that year. And then Brad got like another movie that was a little bigger and like his movies all of a sudden, here we are, you know, in Montreal together on the set, you know, with the big spacecraft and there's, you know, all these actors and, and, um, and it was just like this amazing kind of experience to like have this relationship with, with one of your, um, people that you just feel so close with creatively. So Bradford and I have like um, an understanding, like it's really nice. So he lets me kind of bring what I bring to the table. And so that 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 show is all about kind of softness and, and, and seeing into the shadows and, and, and about like this emotional poetry of the film. So it's, it's not like punchy with like, you know, neon colors and, 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 and vibrant, it's, it's a much softer, a movie which I think people really, I mean, it got nominated for an Academy Award for cinematography amongst many other things. Um, and that was like also another just kind of amazing moment to have somebody that you started with um, early on in their career to then see them like go off and get an Oscar nomination, watch them walk down the red carpet. It was, it was pretty, pretty awesome. Well, and several people in your company have gotten Emmy nominations and awards like crazy. So you've, you've grown the company quite well. <laughs> Last year, we, four of the nine best picture nominees went through Harbor and I forget how many Oscar, like best cinematography nominees there are uh, any given year, but we had over half of them. Wow. So, I mean, that's not gonna happen 
every year. It may never happen again, but it was really, really special to have, you know, um, had so much kind of uh, critical acclaim last year. Well, an impact on the zeitgeist, right? Like impact on culture in a sense, because yeah, those, uh, yeah, absolutely. Those, they seep into our subconscious. Well, and hopefully, you know, when you do something like you take a leap, like uh, when we started Harbor, you know, I just wanted to build some an alternative uh, to Technicolor and Deluxe, both great companies, nothing against them, but like I wanted filmmakers in New York because I I just decided to kind of like make my make my career here on the East Coast um, rather than go out to the West Coast. And, um, and I wanted to create like a, 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 a safe space for like, at the time I was thinking, you know, independent filmmakers. And, uh, and we created this new um, dynamic at the time that really people weren't doing where we had all the editorial suites and the DI theater all on the same floor in the same building. And so my ability to like interact with the filmmakers happened over the course of six months or a year, hmm. rather than just those, you know, two, three weeks that you might have once they were like finished. Uh, and so anyway, so it's very rewarding to see people, you know, um, supporting it and, and then having, you know, the filmmakers like, you know, uh, like a Jim Jarmusch or somebody like editing at Harbor and walking around the halls and, and like you just, your relationship, the dynamic with them just like, changes um with that experience and it's been it's been really cool and I, I i'm assuming you did that on purpose it wasn't just you know by accident that everyone was on the same floor was yeah. that did you do you also incorporate because uh, like i've been at post houses where they have sort of a central bar or a central area to get people to commune uh, to be communal Absolutely. do you guys have yeah like that? it's a wonderful kitchen and it's just like there's some some days where there's nowhere else on earth I'd rather be like, it's packed with amazing people. And it's so cool. You know, again, like having it be like this, this idea, this thing that I started with, with some friends of mine to then, you know, have, you know, like I remember one day, like Ron Howard is there and Danny DeVito gets off the elevator and they see each other and they hug and they were like, so happy to see each other. And I was just like, Oh my God, like, <laughs> how cool is this? Like, I was just hoping we could stay in business. I didn't know that like it would just become this, this thing. And, um, and, you know, you do right by people and, and work hard and, and, uh, and uh, hopefully do good work and, and um, hopefully have success. And, and that's been fortunate, you know, and, and it's been, uh, the timing was impeccable because, you know, all these streaming services now, right. All of a sudden there's just like this pent up demand for, for content, um, and also, you know, tax credits and things like that. So like, like New York's been really cooking for the last 10 plus years since the tax credit kicked in. So it was also just like really great timing to like be able to build something that the industry needed as well. Wow. Now, um, I guess one of the things that uh, when I found out I was gonna be interviewing you, I reached out to a, a friend who had, does some color correction and I was like, oh, what would you ask him? And he wanted to know, cause you've seen like you've, a couple of times there's been where they'll, they'll do a film, uh, you know, they'll do the color correction and then they'll also release a black and white version. So like the Wolverine film, mm -hmm. or there was also um, Mad Max. Mad Max. Right. Um, and he was like, do you, how do you think that impacts your emotional engagement with the, with the, the film? in terms of you're just working with contrast in a sense with the black and white versus the colors. How do you think that would impact an audience viewing it? Well, I mean, I respond very favorably to black and white. Um, <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I did a film last year called The Lighthouse, which was in black and white. And I mean, it was just gorgeous. Um, shot on black and white film, um, which helped a lot uh, as, as well. But, um, you know, I, I, the, the texture of just like that, the contrast in, in the black and white, I think can be very engaging. You know, maybe the color can distract in some ways if it's not done properly. So, you know, I've worked on Seven Samurai, Breathless, Eight and a Half, like these 
classic, amazing, like black and white films as well. <laughs> and, uh, and they're gorgeous. And so I, 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 I love black and white. And I guess somewhat to the question is I will oftentimes when, when I have time in a project that I'm working on, like once I've got the grade uh, kind of starting to work, I, I'll turn my display to black and white and watch my work in black and white just to make sure that the bones of the image are right. Like if something feels weak or off uh, or doesn't match to me in black and white, I'm like, I'm gonna have a problem in color. So, uh, or I may run with two displays. So I may have my main color display and then I might also have uh, a black and white, like a monitor set to black mm -hmm. and white uh, just to like check myself for for like contrast and exposure. So that that's like a little uh, trick that I'll uh, employ every now and again. Yeah. And then the, DP is, the DP will come back next to me and be like, oh, I like the black and white. <laughs> they always love the black and white. Yeah. It makes me think, because when I was a kid, I had one of those little, like a black and white television. And yeah. just make, whenever I see black and white, I'm just like that, it always takes me back to that little tiny television that's right right and, yeah. and the vertical hold would always give away and you'd have to like fix that but yeah those now, were times back then yeah <laughs> kind of fun actually when you think about it um uh, recently a friend of mine uh, said their their kid child ran into the room looking for the mother because they said the tv was broken and they were watching the, and they ran in and the, the kid was trying to watch gilligan's island and they, they they were convinced like there's something wrong with the television because there's no color. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what would you say, like, what films do you look to or what, I guess, artists or filmmakers or writers do you look to for inspiration in your work? Um, well, I mean, we're always kind of, uh, a lot of the work I do with, um, the, the filmmakers that like I collaborate with um, over and over again, I, I do feel like we're kind of channeling like like the Dutch oil paintings, <laughs> you know, trying to get that kind of beautiful, like silky, uh, milky, dark, you know, kind of um, image. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, and I have a lot of photography books, you know, like a uh, Todd Hito and. Saul Leiter and um, William Eggleton, like, well, I, sorry, those books are at my studio, so I don't get to my studio as often as I used to <laughs> anymore. But the reason I bring that up is it's, I like to look at them in the books on a printed surface. Uh, not, I don't have to necessarily have them on my computer because it, it just, it feels different. So, um, and I learned this from, from uh, Harris Savitas, like one of the all time great cinematographers. And I was fortunate enough to work with him on a number of projects. And, and Harris would come in with a stack of books uh, like this. And he, would, he wouldn't like earmark specific pictures and say, this is what I wanna do. He'd say, let's, let's like be quiet for an hour and just flip through these images, like calibrating our brain for like what that looks like versus saying, hey, I'm gonna send you this image in an email and we can put it into the color correction system and, and A, B, like we do that all the time and that's very helpful and there's amazing resources um, like Shot Deck and Film Grab and stuff now where you can go and, and find movies. But uh, I do like to kind of recalibrate my brain looking at stuff in Books, because like there's something about the contrast and the quality of some of the colors, um, like a kind of a rich kind of muted quality of the colors that um, I like to kind of try to reproduce, and and it's just helpful to like um, get yourself in that mindset before jumping into color correcting the image. It's amazing. Do you? It, I, I have one last question that I like to ask everyone I interview. We've been stuck in this sort of crazy at you know pandemic and because of that a lot of people are watching streaming services yeah there's something you've watched over the pandemic that you're like oh everyone's got to check that out <laughs> um 
Well, let's see, uh, our, our great kind of service to the world was in the beginning of the pandemic, we actually did the post for uh, Tiger King. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was like that, I, this crazy viral experience. Um, but really for me, um, I saw a Korean film Minari recently, um, which was just, it hit me, it was beautiful and I loved it. But as far as like kind of a, a streaming kind of um, series, um, you know, Queen's Gambit, that mm -hmm. was, that's the first thing in a long time where I just like kept hitting next, next, next and found myself, you know, three o'clock in the morning, still like not being able to get enough of the show. And, and I thought that was just so well done across the board, you know, from the post-production, everything was beautiful and, and just like the, just the, 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 the style of the show, the design, the cinematography, the act, everything, I was, that, that was like a fantastic show. And it took me a while to finally get to it. I don't know mm -hmm. why, but um, when I finally did it, yeah, I was hooked. That was, that was a great show. It's in terms of the Korea, the Korean film, what's blown me away is after it seems like old boy came out in the early 2000s and then Korea just started knocking it out of the park for like 20 years. Like that's yeah. so many good films coming out of that country. Uh, the, uh, totally. And, and um, I love that. And maybe we'll see, be seeing more of this now with, mm. with the streaming services and, and people like, you know, Netflix and everyone like, producing movies in yeah. the countries because um just like the way they tell like there are more stories to be told you know i think mm -hmm. we maybe have a certain um eye uh or lens through which we see so many movies that come from this country and so like yeah to like see other parts of the world and i know they're making movies around the world mm -hmm. forever but like i think we're getting more and more access to it and maybe you don't have to like dig so much to find those movies and uh, and yeah, I'm really finding myself connecting with with a lot of these kind of um, foreign films now because it's it yeah. just yeah it's just totally taking a, a whole different lens and 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 uh, creative ideas to these stories has been really uh, really fun. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for letting me interview. Yes, my pleasure, Gordon. <laughs> thank you for uh, for having me. And and have a great week. All right, man. You too. All right, thanks. All right, talk to you later. Bye bye. Right, bye.